Let's consider how we actually conduct case studies. What's our process? Let's look at the case study protocol. It's effectively the list that helps you be prepared. The protocol directs the research towards answering research questions. It contains the instruments, the procedures, the general rules and the ethics that are going to guide you. It is essential, particularly for multiple case studies or where you might be drawing on other people in to help you so they can see the way that this is being done. The protocol provides a way to increase reliability. So we start with the guide for the case study, uh, case study report. What's the target output? The journal, most likely for a PhD student. What's the structure of the report, the outline, the format for data, the format for other documentation, the way we're going to format the references, the bibliography? This influences everything else you're going to do. Ethics. Ensure you've got all the required ethics approval complete, the forms for interviewee consents and approvals. This is hugely important because, again, the ethics structures the way you approach the work. Provide an overview of the case study project, the objectives, the hypotheses, any issues to consider, the literature and key reading. And then what are your field procedures? What credentials might you need? Are you going to need passes to get on site for access? What procedures, research and safety are needed? Again, referred to in ethics. What equipment are you going to need? Voice recorders, pencils, paper, that sort of stuff ethics, approval, consent forms that you're going to need to take with you. And what's your case study questions or your interview guide? What are you going to ask people? How have you developed that? And it should all be embedded in literature. What are your sources likely to be? What are the questionnaires and data collection tables, objects or artefacts that you're going to employ to capture that data? So let's try designing a case study protocol. So the first thing is you need to undertake an ethics review. Once you've undertaken a formal ethics review process, that will help you populate a lot of the requirements in the protocol. Then you need to introduce the case and the purpose of the protocol. What's the case study research question, hypotheses and propositions? What's the theoretical framework for the study? Notes on how to use the protocol any standardized agenda for investigators. Then you're going to make some notes on the data collection procedures. What's the name of the sites to be visited and the contact persons? What's your data collection plan, including the calendar period, the visiting times? What's the expected preparation prior to any site visits? What documents need to be reviewed? Where are they? That sort of thing. And what are the correct ethical and consent forms that you're going to need to use when you're collecting data? Then what's the case study questionnaire, the guidance, the tools that are going to be required? Very methodologically dependent. So if you're doing interviews, an interview guide is needed. You might need certain artefacts. One of my students actually had some playing cards, which were part of her study. Uh, I've previously used a very large whiteboard with post-it notes on it, and I was using that to map a process. Then what's the outline of the case study report? So I try and find a similar paper in the target journal and model my structure on that. And then consider how will you present your data? Because the way you're going to present your data will influence the way you collect it. So think about all these points and you can make notes on how you're going to design your own case study protocol. So when we're asking questions, in a case study, in an interview, you need to be prepared to be unprepared. You're going to have less control when you're collecting case study data. In experiments, you can control the conditions. Surveys don't allow for deviation from questions, but when you're asking interviews, questions, in interviewees questions, invariably they'll, they'll meander, they'll talk about things, they'll answer later questions before you've even asked them. And their availability is going to be variable because you know these are subjects in context. They may not cooperate, they may deviate, they may provide data that you weren't expecting. So make sure you have all the resources you could reasonably need. Have assistance and guidance available to you, have somebody on the phone if you can't have somebody else with you. 
but be prepared for change and unanticipated events. Make sure your questions are robust and have the right unit of analysis. This is important for interviews, but actually all research that you're doing. All the questions you ask should have a strong basis in theory. I like to see researchers have their interview questions in a table, but supported with other columns. I want the question, but I also want the meaning of the question. What exactly is it you're trying to achieve with the question? Then the reason for asking that question, where's it taking you? and the references that link to the underpinning theory. So I want to understand really what the question is testing. Then we look at unit of analysis. If we take a question, you know, your research question is about government policy on entrepreneurship, that's very much meta level. So who are you asking? If you're speaking to entrepreneurs, are you perhaps talking at the micro level? How are you going to get to that meta level outcome? What other data might you need to gather? Remember, we, we look at multiple data sources for triangulation. And particularly if you're looking at meta level, you might have country level data sets that you can look at. And then you can try and figure out, well, this area performs particularly well. What were the policies in place there? So design your data collection, individual organisation source. We can really look into how we're ensuring that the questions we ask are robust and at the right unit of analysis. You're going to need to outline your case study. You need to consider the outline, the format and the audience. Now, for a PhD, are you doing a thesis or a paper? The structure of your outline really needs to be in your protocol. I always recommend students look for previous examples, either pull an old thesis from the library or look for papers in the target journal. How have previous cases been structured? What have other research done in the past that look like the research you're wanting to do? Do they have similar research questions that you can look at? This will really help you guide the format of your work. Selecting case studies is not straightforward. You need to identify and select suitable sites and individuals for case study. You may have identified a suitable case and have all the access required, but more often you have to choose and then seek access and that can be time consuming and difficult. Screening procedures help you identify suitable cases and individuals prior to collection. That'll help you and the case collection data process and ensure that what you're trying to do is, is possible. Define the criteria so the theory will help define who you want to speak to and what data collection is required and then decide, is that possible? If you're able to gain more examples than required, you can then put in some you know, random selection to identify a suitable sample. Typically, you're going to be using convenience sampling, but asking those who are available, asking them for further contacts. This provides data that may be geographically or demographically biased, so be careful. But this is the reality of doing research. Let's look now at case selection from one of my papers with Mike Rogerson from 2020. This was a multiple case study uh, in one sector. We focused on food. And that controls for some of the other variables. Now, numerous food based companies were sought who were looking at implementing blockchain and new technology at the time. We knew there were food applications to aid visibility in supply chains being developed. So we identify firms by looking on the web, particularly LinkedIn. And then when we found firms, we asked them for contacts in other firms. It's easier to get a response where we were given an introduction. So some of the roadblocks faced non-response, initial response, then non-response. That's even more frustrating. Uh, unable or unwilling to provide the detail required. Uh, partners objecting to content post. Uh, and organisations requesting their firm name was redacted. So let's go through actually what happened. 73 firms were identified and approached, 42 then responded, 
That led to 15 firm interviews. Nine were allowed to be interviewed for the second time. Seven got to detailed discussions. Finally, four cases. Two firms partnered and two couldn't permit release of information. Um, it was quite frustrating. We did end up with four firms. Um, having more than that, uh, but at the last minute, to be honest, being denied access, being not allowed to publish what we found, uh, you know, that was with, with the seven, not being allowed to release information. And then at the last minute, one of the firms saying, well, you, you can release what we did, but you can't name us. And the other thing, of course, we had to do with those firms we, we did name, we had to get permissions because uh, that's, you know, the ethical side of that we got permissions uh, from those firms to name them so starting with 73 to get four um, that's that's how that one worked out often it's not quite that bad but it's probably not atypical when you're doing case studies you actually start by using what we call a pilot case that enables you to trial your approach. Pilot cases are those usually selected where the informants, those you're working with, are perhaps more sympathetic to the study. They'll allow you to revert back to ask further questions. Uh, they'll allow you to refine your plans. They will be annoyed with you, basically. Um, <clears throat> The pilot case you select may, of course, be the most complex, because if you start with the most complex scenario, anything else should be simpler. Pilot cases form part of your study. They are not a pretest. They're not something you're going to write off because it's difficult to get cases. But they are a source of formative feedback. They help you develop the way you approach this. It's really useful to write up your pilot case study in full after you've done it. And then be explicit in the lessons you've learned, what was the research design procedures and theoretical framings, and that will guide your later studies.